Hey, welcome back to the Breaking Bad Insider Podcast. My name is Kelly Dixon. We're here to talk about episode 306, which is called Sunset. Um, I'm here as usual with my executive producer, Vince Gilligan. Greetings. The writer and director of this episode, John Scheiben. Hello. Uh, our music supervisor, Thomas Gullibich. Hello. And our composer, Dave Porter. Hello. Thanks for coming in, guys. Thanks for having us. Hey, thanks for having us. Cool. Anybody got anything to say before we start? Guess not. Guess not. Okay. <laughs> Um, uh, we're going to start right in because, uh, you know, John, I wasn't really sure what we were going to talk about in this episode, but there's so many people, uh, here that I figured, you know, we could, uh, we, we, there's plenty for us all to talk about. But the first thing I was going to bring up is John, I know you're a big fan of horror and slasher movies. Yeah. And so, <laughs> big, big smile from you. And so, um, we're opening up this episode a little bit different, a lot different actually than we usually open up. So why don't you guys, um, why don't you and Vince start like how you pitch that? You should you should take that one completely because that was that was all you. I, I was out. I was off on a trip to the set. That's uh, right. In Albuquerque, and I came back, and you had that entirely figured out. And it's it's a great teaser. Yeah, talk about that. Uh, yeah, yeah. I knew I wanted to have uh, a scary teaser. We hadn't seen the cousins in a little while, and uh, and I, I I I knew I wanted to do as Kelly pointed out. I'm I'm a fan of horror movies. I've made a couple of them. And it would be great, to, and I think it fits into our show, to do a little mini movie there that is a scary Western, almost. And I, I went to Western, because we've been talking about Westerns all year, and uh, as inspiration, uh, particularly Once Upon a Time in the West. I know that, that uh, I think Vince makes everybody watch it mm -hmm. every year. You have, um, to, you have to watch it naked, too. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> and I always loved the title sequence of that movie, um, which was just a very tense uh uh, two gunmen waiting for another uh, man to get off a train and I started there and started playing with the cousins uh, uh, and we actually as an homage we had uh, the idea, there's this, a windmill place prominently in that sequence in the title sequence of Once Upon a Time in the West this noise from the windmill runs through the whole thing and sort of makes it tense and creepy and and so I, I, I put that in the pitch too, unfortunately when we got to production they couldn't find a windmill they could rent so uh, I think it was Michelle McLaren uh, came up with the notion of a flagpole, and uh, uh, so that uh, and and uh, a flagpole without a flag that makes our haunting noise. But but just to do and and it it, it sort of came together. Uh, I mean, I'm so happy with it, and it's so it, it, it to to be able to do to play all those little horror movie tropes, which we did the the POVs, the tracking shots, the discoveries, the. The, the, the uh, finding the dead body, somebody behind you, all those things. The squeaks, um, the wishes, the flies. And exactly. <laughs> and, you know, one great thing about working on this show is that, uh, and also being with AMC, is that they let us kind of do whatever we want to a certain extent. And uh, so this is like a movie to me, this this teaser. And, and the sound is so important. And Kelly did such a fabulous job in the editing room. Thanks, building that sound, uh, little pieces of sound to increase the tension, to increase the horror, to uh, to set up our cousins as uh, some uh, really bad dudes. Talk about the flies too. How'd you get all those flies? Well, you know, the yeah, the the part of the uh, and everybody has seen it, I assume, when they tune in this podcast. Yeah. Um, so finding the uh, the dead body, um, we did want to play with sound and then play with the visuals. Um, uh, uh, and so the sound of the flies had to be mixed just right to draw this man's attention, the cop's attention, to draw him back there. But when he got there, we had no flies on the set at all. All the flies you see are, are CGI and uh, pretty amazing, actually, I think. Yeah, so amazing. there's no flies in that whole area at all, anywhere. There's actually no insects no, in New I'm just Mexico. kidding. <laughs> it's, it's, we couldn't. There, there were flies, but they they were union flies, and we, <laughs> we uh, couldn't afford them. Um, <laughs> had to bring in scab flies. Yes, <laughs> yes. Can you talk about um, the policeman that you hired? Uh, well, we wanted to be, as always with Breaking Bad, we wanted to be very authentic and it was set from the beginning on a, an Indian reservation this teaser uh, the idea being the cousins needed to hide somewhere while they're waiting for the word that they can you know continue their mission and uh, we thought a cool spot would be uh, a, a reservation a, a old house on a reservation isolated and etc and that they would take over like they took over the the handicap van uh, in a previous episode so uh, we found 
ab- I mean, the, this is probably the first time in my in in my career where I've written a a location and then found exactly what I was thinking of, down to the final shot of the teaser, which was very important to me and it was designed from the beginning as being one shot where you see one cousin with the apple, the cop <laughs> with the gun, and the guy with the axe all stacked. Of course, I embarrassed myself with, with Mike Slovis because I had figured out how I was going to do it, Mr. Director, and, he's, and he just laughed. It's like, no, you don't want that lens. You want this lens. It's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Thank you. That's why you're here, and I'm, you know, back in L.A. But, um, no, no, and it had a front door. I wanted to do that. I wanted to steal the, the searcher's opening shot, which you'll see in there. Which is the that's, door opens. That's probably my favorite shot of the teaser. I thought that was like the um, the Wizard of Oz. Well, it is like the Wizard of Oz too, and a number <laughs> of people uh, have have said that to me. Like, like, oh, it's the Wizard of Oz shot. It's like, yes, it, it is the the, the uh, <laughs> but but the opening shot of the Searchers is is we're on the back on a dark door. It opens to reveal uh, the West, as it were, and then the character walks out, and we go with them, and so. We we timed all it. Took, it actually worked remarkably well. I mean, it was a little tricky getting the timing down, um, and and took a little longer than we had hoped. And and you know, TV directing is all about time. That's the number one concern, number one problem that you have to deal with. And so, but the the cousins were great, and they got their timing right. And it was basically stacking them up, and then me behind the camera saying, "Turn apple." Bite, turn, <laughs> apple, bite, over and over again, and and and, and it worked great. Uh, but this location was was on the Santa Ana uh, Indian Reservation, uh, which was cool. They were great to work with. They, the police chief, gave, the police chief gave me his hat. They were so happy to have us there. It's actually the hat that's in the um, that the, was u- used by the actor who played uh, uh, Officer Chi. Um, and they had a casino there that we would have lunch at, and so that was fun too. So, <laughs> yeah. And we all got, uh, me included, I wasn't even there, we all got uh, wonderful uh, certificates of appreciation from the Santa Ana uh, uh, Pueblo. Uh, the, the, oh, the, cool. Uh, the, I didn't you know got, that. Did you, I get, you didn't get one? I didn't get one. Oh, you know what? I'm sure, we, I'm sure you have one downstairs. It's probably down. It's yeah. probably we're, we're all, yeah. Mine spelled Vince Jillian, but it's a thought that counts. They were, they were very sweet people. Very yes, sweet yes, people. They, they, they were. I'm sure you have one downstairs. And I'm sure I do. They were, they, no, they were very pleased to have us there, and they, they, and they were very helpful. On, and uh, it, it uh, again, it was, it was exact. It, and it took some work to get it there, honestly. Uh, when we went in there, there were... Um, uh, two giant holes in the roof of this building, and we weren't sure that we would be allowed to shoot in there, and uh, because it had been abandoned. But our our, our crack uh, team uh, got that place in order, uh, got it safe. Although they didn't really fix the leaks. At one point, we had them, um, uh, and this is again t- a time issue, uh, and one of the happy accidents that that can happen in New Mexico. We were shooting. Uh, we shot the whole front of the house of the teaser it was on one day, and the back of the house was another day. We didn't shoot them on the same day, um, and we were in t- we intended to, and things were taking longer. And I was, you know, as as Vince can talk about, you know, when you when you write something and then you direct it, all all you all you're doing is cutting things on on the set. It's oh, yeah. like, oh, I want to do this shot, and I want to do that shot. It's like you don't have time. You don't have time. And so I'm cutting down my shot list, and then in the middle of. Uh, uh, a, a setup over the mountains. These clouds just come racing over it with a thunder. I mean, it was like it was like out of a movie. It was like a fan. Someone turned on a Ritter fan or something, and suddenly there's thunder and lightning, and everybody rushes into this little shack with two sides of two thirds of it. It has water pouring down from leaks. So the whole crew is in this little square, <laughs> and we're like, "Do we wait? You know, how long do we wait? You know, and Stu's pacing back and forth, and, and it's like we have to wait. We have to wait." And so I, Finally, you know, we waited about an hour, and then it was like they had to call it. But the good news on that was we had to find a, a, a half a day to finish the teaser, and I was able to go back and, and get a lot of those shots <laughs> that I had to drop on that second day. So, How far away weather... was it from our base camp production? Oh, 45 minutes. It wasn't oh, that far. It's really cool. it's really just down. Um, there's a big soccer center there and a golf course, and and then you drive, and two seconds later, you're on a dirt road, and there's Damn. these little houses and, and satellite dishes and nothing. You know, it's really <laughs> great location, though. Uh, so, um, music guys, you guys had something to do with this teaser, too, right? Well, Dave did. Yeah, we, uh, well, any time that, uh, I'm allowed to call them the cousins now? We, we, Absolutely. We've made that the leap. Cousins, okay. yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Any, anytime our, our friends from uh, from from below the border uh, show up is an opportunity for us to uh, bring back the music that we introduced in in 301 for them and uh, we did bring that back uh, I think to uh, good effect here uh, in the teaser talk about those instruments you use specific to the cousins the use a certain instrument instrumentation and instruments yeah like we, we were fortunate to have a, a, a friend who's uh, who is born and raised in Mexico and is a percussion player. And he has uh, an amazing collection of drums and percussion instruments and actually these really fascinating whistles that are uh, based on, uh, they're actually not the actual ones, but they're based on whatever knowledge we still have of Aztec instruments from oh, quite wow. quite a long time ago. Wow. And, uh, and these things are beautifully carved and they, they sound amazing, the drums and the... And particularly these whistles, you hear them every time the cousins come around. I find a way to fit them in. But they're whistles that the Aztecs used, they're called war whistles. Huh. And they're basically just incredibly shrill and eerie. And they were designed for the battlefield to scare the pants off anybody else, basically. Makes sense. How cool. Yeah. How do they, and how do we know? I mean, the the ones your friend has are they antiques themselves? I mean, there no one has. Does anyone have their? I guess no. There no. Antiques. This is all based on, on yeah on I guess historical literature or whatever wow. clues we have from the past that far ago. Interesting. Yeah. And the Aztecs cool. had pants. Uh, well, I don't know. Wine cloths. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> that's Mel Gibson. Hell no. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um. <laughs> No, it, it actually worked very well, it, it, particularly in the moments here where I wanted to uh, build the tension, creep out everybody what, before he finds the body and as he's walking. And that, uh, uh, I yep. love how that builds attention. tension. It's yep. just great. And then as we often do in, in, in Breaking Bad, and Kelly helped with this, but we, we were typically understated at the end of the teaser in the actual moment of horror and action crunch so, the crunch so we can leave the room uh, as, uh, as uh, John so uh, eloquently said you know the sound plays such a huge role in our show and particularly in the teaser here you can hear it obviously in the rattling flagpole which was you that know was a great touch, great, great touch and, and all, from all the way from the script uh, point of view although it was a it was, it was a, a windmill wheel. originally, wheel. originally wheel. but but the idea was as uh, about about how we use music and sound often goes all the way back to the script. I guess is my point, right. and uh, and we use music often in a way to emphasize what will happen or what may happen, uh, and then when it actually happens, we let natural sound and the realism of the moment make the play for us. Which is very that's a good thing to talk about because that's very different than than most TV shows. Really, I mean, uh, or most movies, I suppose. Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't you guys say uh, uh, usually? And it's it's sort of it's 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 time honored in movies and television that the music tells you how to feel emotionally, reinforces an emotion that is very often kind of apparent, kind of easily gleaned from the context of the story. But uh, we don't. I'm very proud of the way you guys do that. I mean, we just it's a it's a choice. You guys have made and been very smart about. And, you know, we should give a shout-out. Uh, there was an AMC executive named Christina Wayne who mm-hmm. was here right from the pilot, who uh, uh, really interesting, very smart lady, who back originally on the pilot, which I directed, we we, uh, <laughs> we put in, well, just in case folks don't, it, the, the, in the original cut, the original cut of the pilot, we I did, it was before you were even hired, yep. uh, I did a... Uh, uh, and this was before we, both you guys were hired, before I knew either of you, you gentlemen. Uh, I did a, uh, uh, Kelly was an assistant on the pilot, and we cut in. We spent two and a half days cutting in music. Two and a half days cutting in music. We had 24 cues. Had, God, I can't even, I cringe oh, wow. at the thought. I cringe at the thought. We had 24 Vince brought cues. in. he brought in a duffel bag of CDs. Yeah. Like a duffel bag. Put this in, put this in, yeah. put this in. I had an iPod with uh, 7,000 songs on it, and yeah. I brought in a duffel bag of CDs, and... Uh, we put get this, in, get this, get yeah. this. We, we put, put spent two and a half it. days putting in exactly putting in twenty four cues, and Christina uh, said hated every single hated one every of single them. one of them, and I was <laughs> kind of bent out of shape over, <laughs> but she was right, and it's uh, I have to. Not one of them lived. Well, one actually, one of them twenty one of them out of the twenty three were uh, discarded. One of them wound up uh, under duress. 
Who was that? Thomas. I don't remember the name, but that uh, was I remember the, the, the Molotov tray. Yeah, Molotov, Molotov tray. Yeah, yeah Molotov. Okay. Uh, when the when he's driving like hell away from the uh, scene of the fire and and all that uh, in the RV, the back of the RV catches fire, or the grass behind it rather. Apocalypse but, shit is it? Apocalypse yeah, shit right, is a track right. by Molotov. That's right. And um, you guys were almost giving the blows on that one too. Well, you know what? And looking back on it, I have to say she was a, she's a very smart lady and was a real asset to the show. And really, and and you guys, I think you guys agreed with with her. I mean, you, with her original philosophy on it. Don't have the music tell you everything that's going on. But I had come from I would you know done a lot of TV and and and, and a little bit of movies and and what I had come from. God bless it, wonderful stuff. It was it was sort of. That school of of, oh, of, no, of, of of scoring everything, either with source music or, or written score. Mm-hmm. And I think, Christina, I, my hat's off to her. And then you guys have taken that ball and run with it. It's still a good cut, though. <laughs> you know what? It's so different, though. Yeah, it it's really so different. very different. I think, uh, I think less, and, and it, which is not to say, it's like printing too much money. You print too much money. It deflates the value. Deva- de- exactly. You suddenly, it's mm-hmm. uh, it's uh, post World War One Germany, and a loaf of bread costs like sixty million Deutschmarks. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like uh, you guys, Dave, you write such wonderful music, and Thomas, you come up with such wonderful source pieces uh, uh, that. Uh, but we use them so sparingly, partly because we don't have any damn money. <laughs> but but uh, but but honestly, even if we had all the money in the world, I don't think we'd go nuts we with the music. Spend it really poorly. No, <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of parties. To you that they're, they're really trying just to work less. <laughs> it's what about that? When neither of us really say a word in the spotting. There's no, no music this week. This worked out really well, Dave. I think you know we get brought in a lot. I think to Dave and I to to fix problems. I think that part of the job of a music supervisor or a composer is to look at something objectively and be able to say this needs a little bit of help. How can we help it? And one of the things that was really clear to me from the pilot was that we really could have had no music in that entire pilot and it would have been incredibly powerful. And when I watched it, there was music all over the place. And my first thought was, okay, Christina's talking less is more, and I think I see where this is. Let's see how we can navigate to find a place where you feel so comfortable that it's still your pilot, but it's something where each moment is sort of being captured on its highest strengths. And I think that one of the things that happens with having music all the way through is you start to lose sight of the greatness that's already there. And I think that whenever someone's working on something, especially they've written and directed themselves, you know, your own natural uh, self-criticism is probably going to be like, oh, that shot could have been better, this or that. In a way, a music supervisor can be very helpful in that they're relatively objective, and they come at it, hopefully, with a sense of how can I contribute here without pulling, taking away. And I think in this particular case, because the pilot was so well written, so clearly, you know, and very... Uh, uh, the, the navigation of the direction was so clear and how the story developed and how much information is brought across that it really, it was very easy, I think, for us to just pull everything back into the bare essentials and make sure that the story was really what was being led and the music was simply supporting in the right moments and, and nudging things along. Well, you guys did great. Let's talk about your contributions to John's episode here. Which, ironically, I think has the most music of an episode this year. Does that mean yeah. it needs the most fixing? Is you that what right? Right? No. Yeah. Well, You had the most in the least. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Well, the funny thing, too, is that I didn't really think about it, but there's like three montages in this thing. And, I mean, I really didn't think about it when we were starting to cut it. I didn't think about when we read it, when I read it. But then it was like, oh, my God, I've got to do this one, now this one, now this mm-hmm. one. They're all great, yeah. though. They're all yeah. awesome. But well, we have a tricky thing with, with, with montages because on one level, montage is a great way of condensing time, obviously, and moving a lot of plot information forward very efficiently and using music to move everything forward. However, they take a lot of setups. So when you have a limited budget, and this has happened a lot this season, we've had lots of ideas of montages that we wanted to do or big you know, transition moments, but we just simply didn't have time to get the setups. Do you think we should explain what a montage is? Like, sure. For instance, in this episode, it's... Uh... Yeah, usually a montage is when you take, and you know, I think the South Park guys could probably elaborate more appropriately on this, but basically you take a whole series of different shots that are telling a story, a narrative of some sort, and rather than using dialogue or action specifically, you allow uh, leaps, jump cuts, um, you, know, uh, uh, you compress time in essence, and then by using music you allow it to have almost like a, um, 
a, a bed that it sits underneath that keeps it cohesive. And the energy of the music will help to make all of those individual cuts make sense as a narrative and have sort of a, a, a rise and a drop. And at the end of it, you have a lot more information and you've just compressed it all into two minutes, 30 seconds, in a minute, however long it is. Or you can make something very mundane interesting. Yes. And I don't mean that, but I mean we do have a montage where Walt's making a sandwich and getting dressed. And, right. Which is know. a great one. I love that montage. I love all the little and the bits of business. I love the shots yes. you got, John. And I love the little bits of business where he's... Do we, where did that come from? He's he's uh, Walt's buttoning his he's buttoning his shirt and then he flicks a little bit of lint away. <laughs> yeah, that that was pure Brian. I just said you know, I, I just set up the shot and said and gave him a straight into plastic and said go and we'll just do this a few times and yeah. he he would he was totally into it and he really and, you know and, and I would say do your belt but his little flair with it I just yeah. love. He's just got you know he uses the pinky a lot. He does. Those. He does. Yeah. And I don't know what that means. But, um, <laughs> you want to talk about the? Uh, no, but I, I, I did want to talk about the, the the cooking montage because we had the, uh, uh, the, the the first montage, the dressing montage. We didn't have music there. That was just uh, let's set up as much as we can, and we'll put you in the kitchen, make your sandwich, and we put your cameras on them, and we shot a bunch of different variations. And then we said, okay, let's move over here. And then and I knew where we wanted to end because the end of the montage is. He's waiting, waiting, waiting to go pick up his son before he goes to work. Um, and so I knew he went in, 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 in Vince's chair. That is Vince's condo you're looking at, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and his furniture, um, you know, which is all for sale on eBay. Right. <laughs> uh, and so, but we didn't have a specific piece of music. And when we got in the editing room, I made a suggestion that we cut it to. Um, and that's one of those that could probably work with a number of, Different styles, and ultimately, uh, Thomas came found. Uh, uh, what's the name of that song that we have it's in there? It's called with Ginza. That? It's by uh, uh, Vince Guarani. No, not that one. The first one. The, oh, the first the, the one. The, oh, I'm the, sorry, my the, bad. The, the country, yeah, it's uh, yeah. Buddy Stewart. Buddy Stewart. Uh, Sunshine on me. Which is so perfect. Go ahead. I, I, we should give a shout out to. You should give a shout out to Buddy Stewart. How many of his, his have we used this We've season? We've used. I, I think we <laughs> two, and we might be on three. We'll have to see. And it's a weird story too, because Buddy Stewart was essentially a singer in the '60s, I believe who was demoing different material. He would shift genres completely and then demo these songs that he's written that he had sung to develop himself as a music artist. Mm -hmm. I don't think his career ever really took off, but these recordings are kind of great. And one of them is in the great scene with Walt driving the car when he has the money thrown at him, which is the uh, in the Valley of the... In the Valley of the Sun. Exactly. I love that song. Yeah. And that was just one of those tracks that he was sort of doing a country demo and suddenly it became what it became. This one was he was doing it for a Frank Sinatra record. He was trying to get songs that Frank Sinatra might sing and introduce his music that way. And that's Seems where like we got sunshine on me. I know, exactly. <laughs> so it's just he was kind of going for the snappy style. And then these, rec these, uh, these recordings got unearthed and someone realized that they really were very charming and quite interesting on yeah. their own and they fit our show well because they're not quite this, they're not quite that. Yeah. They're kind of their own weird beast. Well, they feel, they f it feels like you've heard them before but you haven't and that's what's kind of nice yeah. about it. You're not bringing any associations to it. You're not bringing memory. Mm -hmm. Oh, I remember that song from when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. But it feels like you should. Right. And that's really, it's, it's really an interesting phenomenon. Actually. It is. I love this stuff. And, I, it, and these demos are so old that our, our wonderful mixer, uh, Jeffrey, uh, had a struggle with them. Had a struggle with them because they, uh, um, he said they were hydrolyzed or they. Yeah, were... what happened was that when they transferred over these original tapes, which are basically these old old school tapes, they old go magnetic tapes. magnetic tapes yeah. exactly. They go over a head, but the tapes themselves have been so warped that it falls off of the head. Right. And it's very hard. And if you pull too hard, what ends up happening is you snap the tape. So you have to find sort of an in between. And frequently, you can only do it once which means you can only one time, you might actually soak the tapes and then run them through wow. uh, in order to get it, but then the tape dies immediately afterwards. Right. You get one shot get to one get shot. a transfer. Because they're so dried out from sitting on a shelf for exactly. 50 years probably. Mold These, and, yeah. and you know, mildew, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I want to hear about the Vince Guaraldi, because you, you found the Vince Guaraldi piece, right? Uh, no, actually he did. Oh, um, oh I'm sorry. Um, okay. um, but I, uh, I took credit for it. Um, yes, you should. <laughs> I, I, uh, uh, no, but I... I we started talking very early on. This was a, this was sort of the opposite situation where where I knew I wanted to have the music on the set to shoot to, uh, very specifically for the the rhythm. I mean, the, the story, as as Thomas puts it, and he's right. This this montage is meant to tell a story, and this was meant to tell the story of of, of Walt and Gail, um, and it was kind of romantic, <laughs> and it was kind of these two these two like minds coming together, and uh, uh, Thomas sent me a number of 
thoughts uh, in, in very different genres, uh, everything from opera to classical to to rock and roll. And uh, but when when Vince Guaraldi's piece jumped up when uh, he offered Ginza, I jumped at it because. I'm a big fan of Charlie Brown Christmas, okay? And that's yeah. the greatest music ever. I maintain... Well, my, yeah. oh, can't say that. I don't so. think we can hum it or we have to pay for it. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but I, I, I maintain that, that that is such a classic, that Charlie Brown Christmas from, what, 64, 65? Mm-hmm. I maintain yeah. it, it would not have... It's great in many respects. Not, not really the animation so much, but the story. <laughs> but uh, I maintain it's that Vince Guaraldi music yes. that has kept it a classic yeah. for... Going on 50 years now. Yeah. And you get that weird chill. Like when you hear that song, Skating, which is part of the Charlie Brown Christmas, yeah. you almost have this immediate association with the holiday and with the general feelings that you have. There's a sweetness to it. There's a lightness mm, to yeah. it. There's also sort of interesting sophistication to it because it is sort of modern jazz for its day. Mm-hmm. But it has sort of an innocence and a sweetness and it has even a little bit of melancholy in there. Yeah. It's like all of the odd emotions that happen during the holidays. You know, I'll get encapsulated in that. Yeah. And Ginza had a little bit of that sort of romantic quality in the sense because you sort of you're looking at these two men who, in a way, are perfect working partners. And part of the tragedy of you know Jesse and our things, we love Jesse so much, and when we see Gail come in, we have a sense that oh my God, there's actual competition for Jesse's yeah. role here. And part of I think what's very successful of our season is giving Gail a little bit of a. Um, He's sort of a perfect character for Walt. Well, you know, uh, speak, so, speaking oh. of Gail, let's talk. You, you had uh, you created uh, Gail here. Talk about uh, David Constable. Oh, oh, the, Gail is 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 one of my favorite characters. I love Gail, and uh, he was fun to write. Um, we wrote up some sides, and we were early in casting. Um, often sides are uh, lines for the actors to read because the script hadn't been written yet but I got a message that Vince wanted to start looking for this guy sooner rather than later so I wrote up a, a, a couple of scenes sent them along the first tape I saw I don't know if you saw anybody else the very first one was was this actor David uh, how do you pronounce his name? David, David, Const- David Constable, like, Constable like Constable except without the end isn't he a friend of Sam's? He's a Sam Catlin, one of our writers, uh, is a longtime uh, old old buddy of David's, and because uh, Sam used to make his living as an actor before he's a writer, and uh, yeah, I mean it was uh, Sam I think who said, "What about David?" Although maybe uh, somebody else had the idea simultaneously, someone like Peter Gould or somebody, or no, maybe Tom Schnauz had it. Oh, but right, right. Tom Schnauz mentioned him too because he'd been watching him on Damages. He's, right, man, exactly. he is he is ro- he's oh, he, a rogue cop he's, on Damages, but he's deep in evil. Well, Tom had been watching he's like the exact opposite. <laughs> yeah, Tom had been watching Damages, great show. Uh, uh, give a shout out to them. And he was watching Tom, one of our writers, was watching Damages, and then the commercial came on, and the same evil cop now was playing this this dorky dad on some cell phone commercial. Oh, serious? <laughs> yeah, and it's David. That's, that's yeah, range. Yeah. Now you see like, range. Holy cow, no, no it he's is, amazing. man. He is, like, yeah. he is mean, mean, mean. They kill him I mean, on the, on, on the show, season. on the show. Yeah, he's they, a, he's they a they wonderful, sweet guy season, in real life. Boy, he's yeah. a killer. And then to see him in this was like, whoa, nah. <laughs> yeah, but tell you about working with him. He's a great guy. Uh, he was he was uh, as much of a joy as, as the character Gail is for Walt. He... he uh, and it, and it wasn't easy. Um, uh, 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 he had to read a very long poem um, by Walt Whitman and read it uh, in uh, with a lot of emotional ups and downs, and not lose the audience, and not lose. It, it's it's a very tricky uh, moment, and uh, uh, and he was able to. In fact, he came. We, we you know he, he would he would do a take, and then we talk about it and try this, try that kind of thing. But he. He was able to do a range of versions of it, so there were that were some more passionate, some less passionate. So we had choices when we got in to the cutting room, um, and uh, uh, and he was especially. It was actually a lot of fun. We we only again time is the thing when you're directing in television. It's always time. They're always telling you you're 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 late and short, and you've got to move on. And we had arranged to get, they gave me, that was the one day of overtime was the day that we had, um, we shot the uh, cooking montage and did not get everything that um, I wanted. And thanks to Michelle McLaren, thanks Michelle, um, she picked up more shots uh, because as Thomas said, you need, you need a lot of material for a very, in a very small space of time here, but you, you, you need different material. You need stuff to, to build this, to tell this little story. You need a lot of setups, basically. 
so we had an hour and a half, uh, and we actually got a lot done. It was it was sort of like um, it was sort of like film school again. Uh, we put this Vince Caraldi music on really loud in the in the soundstage, and had two cameras and the two actors, and they were just totally into it. So they're like, I could do this, I could do that. And we were just running around, shoot it, shoot it. It was, it was a blast, and we got some great stuff. We did the chess game, we did, we did some of the venting and stuff, and we did the whole blue bit where they're putting the trays in, the, the sped up bit, and, and, uh, and we, got, we actually got a lot in, in an hour and a half. Um, uh, but then uh, uh, the, two, the, the two of them together, the Walt and Gail, um, and we had done this last at the end of the day, so they had all day together, basically, getting to know each other as characters. And so the the, the rapport between them that you can see in their eyes and their little looks and their and their pouty faces <laughs> and whatnot, wow. was, was, was amazing. It was it was it, it, it made a lot of fun. Yeah, tell them about uh, this fun little tidbit that I that Kelly had to tell me because I wasn't there on the set. Uh, chess. The chess game, they're never in the same frame together playing chess. That is true. We the, the original idea behind the the uh, chess game was that it would be a split screen, and so we we locked the camera down wide and we were going to shoot one actor coming in, making a move, going off as if they're running this game while they're cooking. So they're not they aren't there at the same time. They're you know it's a, it's like chess on a computer with somebody you know you make a move and then you're doing something else you come over you make your response and then they come over and uh, uh, we did a couple of takes that way um, and then Kelly actually once she got the foot she's like what the hell is this and I she didn't just, know that's <laughs> she made she cut it no she she actually had a, a really good idea not only for time because the other time battle that that we always face is that 43 minutes or whatever length of the show so. 47 thank 47. god but but still it's very short <laughs> yeah. yeah so she said i think there's a faster way to do this chess game and i think it's actually cooler and i think she was right so she took the two and and just married them on the avid actually and nobody noticed Nobody, nobody saw it. Noticed that, yeah, that the hands would. There's a, basically they, there's a mat line in the middle of it. disappear, but they fixed that. So they fi you yeah, know, they out, it. out there in TV land, you'll never know. But yeah, they were never together. Saw it here, you, and, and it's it's just sort of a testament to, uh, I think the actors mostly because you're watching them and you never notice this guy's hand disappears as he reaches across the table and then reappears. Well, also what's fun in it too. I don't know if anybody will notice. I mean, nowadays when people stop all the time and they um, freeze frame and. Stuff, but Walt's Walt's side of the of the uh, of that little yes. chess game, he jump cuts, and yes. Gail's side does not jump cut. So that's kind of the giveaway. Walt's Walt jump cuts in there, and, and Gail does. That's not. the only giveaway because the hand thing John's talking about was has since been fixed. Yeah, but but fixed every that. time I saw it with your Avid version, I should say for folks, the Avid is the computer system that we edit the show on. It's called the Avid. It's a company that makes it. But every time I saw it on the Avid before it was fixed, I, I didn't even see his hand completely disappears yeah. at a certain point. Yeah. But I, I think that also is a tribute to the music and how, how it works in montage is that that, that that bed sort of carries you along as a viewer, and, and you don't notice things like that. It doesn't matter to you. You're too interested in, in sort of the, the, the combination of everything and the sort of music video aspect of it. Yeah, well, it's funny too, but I just was going to say that you know we didn't have all this, all the pieces of this montage for several weeks. Yes. And we had a little bit, and then I'm, when I got it, I'm like, he wants to make a montage out of this? No way. And then, <laughs> and then uh, you know, because you know, montages like the way that I work usually is, you know, montages usually take time because there is no script, and you you have to be really creative, and you know, sometimes you can't be really creative, and you're on the gun to be really creative. So I usually cut everything else and wait till the end. And when I saw that we didn't have enough, I was asking like our post producers, "There more coming?" And nobody knew the answer. And I was like, "Well, I'm not. There's no way I wouldn't that answer this your is the money." Yeah, yeah. John, John was like stonewalling I tried to talk to me. Kelly as little as possible. Yeah. <laughs> he would not call back. He would, in fact, he called everybody else but me. He would call people in my room to talk to them, and he wouldn't call me. No. Oh, please tell Kelly to step out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it was um, it and, and so finally I said, you know what? I know that this can't be all the pieces. There's got to be more. And when he finally got into town, he goes, no, 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 there's more. And so, you know, your show was done filming in November, but we didn't get all the pieces until the end of January. Because originally that montage was written to be very different than what it ended up being. Yeah. That montage was written to have all kinds of split screens and, and boxes and, you know, stuff like that. I mean, that's the way the script was. And when we looked at the whole show and we saw that really it was 
you know, the first time Walt and Gail are getting together and Walt's basically finding a soulmate, it was like, I told John, I said, look, you know, you're the director and the writer of this. I'm not going to tell you what to do, but when I look at it, it really doesn't need all of that, you know, extra computerized generated work. It just needs to Which be Which is why story. I didn't answer your phone calls for a while. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, John. Uh, I appreciate kidding. that there's, one. There's, <laughs> there's, a, there's, I will say, though, it's funny, uh, tying together what you just said with what John was saying a few minutes ago, it, it's... I mean, because I directed the last episode of this season. It's the first time I've directed uh, uh, since the pilot, and I've never done it in eight days before. Uh, the pilot had 15 or 16 days. It wow. is so damn hard. Oh, my God, that pilot was 31 to do days any long. of these episodes. I have, such renewed, <laughs> I have such renewed respect for anyone, uh, John, Michelle, Adam Bernstein, any of our wonderful directors who gets through this thing unscathed and actually has something to cut together. But it's so true. You have such big plans when you're prepping as a director, and so much of it goes by the wayside because it has to because yes. there's just no, no time. You're always going to be ambitious, but there's no time to shoot it all. But it's amazing how some often how little you need when, when you have a good script and good actors, how little you really need of all the bells and whistles. Well, it, and that applies too, honestly, and I, I probably shouldn't say this because WGA will get down on me, but it's amazing to me how... You know, we start in the room and we break these stories, and we're we're trying to we're trying to tell uh, a complex, but uh, we're trying to tell a story, and we think we need this scene. We think we, we had scenes in here that we ended up cutting that I had to shoot, um, uh, scenes with Dean and and uh, uh, his boss, scene, you know, uh, for example, and you think you need them, and you and you fight for them, and and you're in the budget meeting saying, no, no, I must, we must find a way to do it. Um, what's amazing about this whole process uh, to me is that I, I do think we needed it. I think we needed it not necessarily for the final product, but I think I think it helped the actors know where they were. It helped the, the reader. It helped the studio, the network. It helped the, the cast and crew to know what the story was. And then if we and then when you get to the editing room, you're remaking the whole thing, and you and you find God, you know it it works just as well without that scene. The audience knows where Hank's head is at, for example, and. Uh, and it, in fact, works better without it, perhaps. And uh, it's, it, it's it's kind of amazing to me. I, but I do think one of the cause people often say, or, or, or you know, executives will say, why 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 are you shooting so much? You know, why, why? You, it's only forty seven minutes, and you've got sixty. And it, I, I really believe you you need that. I really because we're trying to figure out how to tell this story the best way possible. Nobody and, is that good to shoot forty seven usable. No, know, it's only. impossible. There's no way. It is an old film school. Uh, uh, thing that they send you out and say shoot shoot uh, yeah. a five minute scene without cuts and shoot exactly five minutes and tell a story within it but yeah hey uh, now you've opened up uh, you, you got to explain to them what you're talking about the scene with hank because because none of them have seen it because it's not that's in the, right it's that's not right. in the episode so the the top of act one actually didn't begin with walt um at at vince's condo um <laughs> it, it, it it which actually is a great way to open and i love it but it started with a scene where hank Catches up with um, uh, 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 his ASAC is is crossing the, uh, the parking lot, and it actually wasn't written for the parking lot; it was written for the DEA. But once again, uh, in in basic cable television, you're fighting time, and there was no way we could go to the DEA set uh, and the hospital on the same day. So um, uh, we had to figure out a way to. So we, we decided, okay, we played in the parking lot. So we'll pretend like there's a parking lot that's the DEA. It was still difficult to do because it looks nothing like the DEA, and it doesn't even look like it's in the same part of town. So I kind of had to shoot it long lens and very tight, and and uh, and stack them up against cement walls and things like that. But uh, it, it was a, it was a nice scene. It, it was Hank catching up with him and wanting him to sign uh, a, a warrant to get a wiretap. Yeah, to get a wiretap for on on Jesse Pinkman, and it was a way to uh, to reintroduce that storyline. Um, to the audience, and uh, and also give us an idea that Hank has sort of been, is sort of uh, uh, on his way out, as it were. Uh, he's on the edge. Uh, he's been obsessed with this case too long, and is starting to get noticed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, once it was shot and cut together and put in the show, and we were facing some time constraints, the decision was made to take it out. And honestly, the first time we see Hank, he's in the car. He's got a pile of junk food in the seat next to him, and we get it. And he's and he's frazzled, and he and he tells his wife, "I ain't giving up on this one. 
we get it. You don't we didn't need that scene. Nice scene. It'll be on the DVD, hopefully. You know? Yeah, it'll be on the DVD. <laughs> Folks can watch it on the DVD extras. But it's 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 it's. I'm, I'm always amazed at this process because you really you really make a, a movie or TV show three times. You make it in the in the writers' room. You make it uh, on the set, and then you make it again in editing, and it's another thing. Um, and it's fascinating. Hey, before we get um, before we have to quit, I I wanted to talk to you guys about. Um, the other old friend that we're losing. I remember when I read the outline, and none of these guys up here had read it yet. And I said, "Oh, we're gonna lose an old friend. We're gonna lose somebody. We're gonna lose, some, you know." And everybody's like, "Who? Who? Oh my God, they're gonna kill so and so." And and then uh, they finally read it, and they're like, "Is that the old friend you were saying?" But it yes. is kind of the RV. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh man. Well, uh, the good news is that that's not the actual, that is not our actual RV that gets crushed. Are you serious? Oh, you didn't know that? No, are you serious? No, no, no. Yeah. We, oh, we're we're no. saving that one for the Smithsonian. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, yeah, tell, tell them. You're yeah. lying. No, well, it's not the same lying. one. I'm, really? I'm lying about the, well, some little part of me is hopefully not lying about the Smithsonian. <laughs> but, uh, really but I'm not is. lying about the RV. Tell them. Oh, yeah. I no, so we, did not we, know that. We actually, honestly, there, there are two RV sets. One is a practical RV that has the front half uh, is dressed and can shoot in. Uh, and and it can drive, and that's the one that you see driving around or parking, etc. We have a set on stage that's the back half of the RV that's dressed and has walls that can fly, which means you can you can move them so you can light in there. And that's where we do all the interior stuff in this episode, except for Joe and Walt talking to old Joe in the front and Walt uh, closing the curtains in the front. Everything else was done on stage, looking the other way, um, which are the weird sort of constraints that you have to do. Um, and, and it's weird for the actors, it's weird for everybody because they, they, you do half a scene basically and then you turn around and do the other half a, a week later. Right. So. But the, uh, we, we ended up finding an RV that was, uh, that was of the same, uh, similar model, it wasn't quite the same color, um, and we filled it with doubles of a lot of the paraphernalia that, that uh, <laughs> we had from the show and they put curtains in that match. And, um, we put in they they they, uh, they put in those lawn chairs that were in there. They put in uh, they actually also put in under tarps. They put uh, 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 aquariums, empty aquariums, just so that there'd be stuff to crush and wow. stuff would fall out, and it would look it would look. Uh, I so did not know that. Yeah. And, a big, and a big things of, of liquid, so that you see in one of those shots, you see as if juice is being squeezed out of a. Limb. Yes, yeah, it's interesting because we, we when we were scouting, we saw three or four different ways to crush this thing and that one was this giant industrial crusher that literally the ground shakes I mean it's it's, it's four stories tall and they drop cars in from the top and it just comes out in little pieces and it was insane <laughs> but it, that doesn't didn't work for us we, and we wanted the from the beginning everybody wanted A it, it needed to be done in secret but B we wanted Walt and Jesse to be there watching their friend be put to rest and you couldn't do it with that giant machine so we found this this it's, it's basically a portable crusher and it wouldn't fit the whole RV in at once. So that was another issue. They were like, what are we going to do? Well, you know, there's all these suggestions flying around. You know, we could cut it. We could do this. But then we, we actually asked them. To, we, 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 got a, we found a junk RV on their lot there. And, uh, uh, and everything that you see there is uh, the set deck in that junkyard were all cars. That, that was like a really fun day, actually. I went in on a Saturday, and uh, they had a guy with a forklift. And it was like, put the cars where you want to. It's like, yeah, I can play with these wrecked cars. I want one here. And, oh, that's great. Did so, they let you drive it? Uh, no, they didn't let me drive. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, we found an RV, and they did a test for us. And watching that test was really educational because they had to basically, basically break it in half first and put it in pieces. And they used a forklift to do it. And that's where the idea of that camera, the IMO camera that we put inside the RV, when those two blades come in. Actually, if you look closely um, on the top of that shot, it's already punctured, but you don't know it because the blades went in and and then the, the the remote operator on the IMO was like we're not rolling it didn't roll it didn't start rolling so I'm like stop screaming at this guy stop don't I crush anymore I didn't so he pulled it. back they, they put the curtains sort of back up with tape and then they started the camera rolling and then he smashes it in another spot and you don't really see it. it looks like it's sunlight coming through a window or something you can't really tell that it's been yeah. punctured but they tear it in half and when they crush this test one all the, they usually drain they drain most of the fluids but there was antifreeze still in there and it came out like this green blood, and it was such a cool image that I, I said we got to have stuff in there. So we, so they put in gallons of, 
of, and they went for blue. They said, let's do it. You know, the art department's so into it. They're like, we'll, we'll give you blue. It'll be like blue meth. You know, I'm like, I, who knows? Well, they wouldn't technically have left the meth in there, but anyway, uh, you know, cool. So you can see, okay, but we, they, we threw, you know, what was weird watching the test one, though, was it was somebody's RV, and so, like, all these personal items came out, so I made sure we threw some clothes in there because it was just kind of sad and creepy to yeah. see somebody's, you know, folded up map and their sweatshirt Funyuns. and this and, and Funyuns. We put Funyuns in there. Yes, yeah, a lot of Funyuns. Yeah, you know, and, uh, and then, and that was, a, that was a very long day, and we were, we, the sun was setting, as you can see in the, uh, hence the title. Um, the sun was setting, and so we, um, we got as many cameras as we could find. We got video cameras, we had cameras inside, and we got one take, basically. Uh, you ain't going back. So cut it up, and, and we just, uh, and I put Brian and, and Aaron nearby, and I said, just do something, you know, just look like you're sad about it, okay? Because <laughs> you couldn't hear anything, you know? I couldn't give them direction once we started, it was so noisy. And then we just went, and uh, I thought it turned out. And then Ke Kelly found all the, the heartbreaking spots, I think. I had to well. speed them up too because that thing it just it doesn't move very fast. It is, boy, yeah. it's like yeah. snail's pace. That <laughs> yeah, if you look close, you can tell too. it's sped up a little, but it, it works. There's yeah. a lot of footage too. I mean, we use like a very small fraction of all the stuff that you guys had. Yeah, yeah. Getting because it gets cut in half, and they take a chainsaw to the thing. Yeah, well, they have to cut the axle and they yeah, have to do all it's this like stuff. It was lengthy. It's a great scene and made even better by that great music, uh, yes. Thomas. Yes. Uh, in this Zephyros. case, uh, Los, Los Zephyros. Los, the, the Sapphires. The Sapphires. They were a mid 1960s. They were a mid 1960s uh, sort of a Cuban doo-wop group who were doing sort of covers of pop tunes. Um, this particular song is sort of a, a very famous Latin American sort of ballad. And it's very sad, and, and the vocalist has sort of a, a wonderfully, uh, I don't know how to describe his voice, it's, it's not male, it's not female, it's sort of otherworldly and beautiful, and it has such a, uh, I don't know, such a sense of sadness and sweetness to it, it just sort of felt right. I think we threw a few different ideas, we tried classical there, we tried some jazz, we tried some rock stuff, but I think this one really felt right from the get-go for everybody. Uh, Cuban do uh, We should also quickly say uh, we're welcome, welcoming... Matt Jones back, right? This is the first episode. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Mayor Badger, uh, yeah, who we yeah, love. Badger for first returns. episode, uh, yeah. Badger returns for season, uh, season. what the hell season are we up to? Three? <laughs> Three. <laughs> yes. Who am I? When do that's I get right. my Zwei back? <laughs> but, uh, yeah. He needs to do river dance. Yeah, so yeah, river dance. Yeah. He, was he fun to direct? He was a blast, and he would just, you know, basically he would give you what was on the script and they say can i try something it's like go ahead it's just <laughs> funny you know it's like, yeah, skinny pete of course we saw skinny pete last week and i love him too those two guys are great all three of those guys and aaron great together yeah mm -hmm. and we yeah. see clovis again the return and, of clovis and larry and hankin are. and larry hankin talk about yes, larry hankin yeah. i love he old joe is so good mm -hmm. he did such a good job Yes, you know, I didn't realize, I, I loved his audition, we, we, you know, we get, we get uh, uh, quick times on the computer and that's how we do a lot of casting these days. Um, and I saw his and, and he looked vaguely familiar and, and, and then I, you know, and we were talking, it's like, oh, he did a thing on Seinfeld, yeah, that's right, and then he did a thing on uh, Friends, yeah, that's right. He was the other Kramer, right? Yeah. On I Seinfeld. There, there was Seinfeld, they're making the TV version of their life, and he's the guy who gets cast as Kramer. Am I right about this? Mm -hmm. I think he's. I think I'm right. I think so. I may be wrong. I know he did a, a piece on it. Um, but the, the, the coolest thing to me, and so I, we, I, I worked with him, and, and he was great, and he was very funny, and he really was the character. Uh, uh, and then uh, afterwards, I'm, I'm flipping around. When I got back to the hotel, after he had left, actually, I was flipping around TV, and... Uh, 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 AMC, ironically, was showing uh, Escape from Alcatraz, which is a great Clint Eastwood yeah. movie. And it's like, oh my God, I know that guy, but he doesn't look like that now. Oh, it was him. It was Larry. And uh, and I, I kicked myself because I wanted to ask him, yeah. you know, because I didn't realize it before. Uh, uh, I want to ask him about that experience, but uh, he's just a chameleon. He's just fun. Don Siegel's last movie, I think. Yeah. And, and Mark Johnson, our executive producer, was on that movie. Honestly, uh, God, honestly, yeah? you can ask Mark about uh, uh, well. Escape from Alcatraz because he was on that movie. He was, and he reminded Clint Eastwood of this like a year or two back. Uh, yeah. He was, uh, what the heck was he? He was an AD, I think. He was an assistant really? director on Escape from Alcatraz in 79. Oh, my God. Yeah. Well, we should wrap it up, but just right quick, um, you basically now have a, a lot of, uh, a lot more, you've given a lot of power to Gus that we're getting to see now, and you're making Gus and uh, our guys, your 
flipping him onto the trail of Hank Schrader. How did that go down? Because you guys have been building an arc. He's not as nice as uh, he's first seemed. He's not yeah, quite no. the gentleman meth dealer we, we might have <laughs> thought. Yeah. And and boy, Giancarlo, what a great actor. Yeah, he, oh, he did. Uh, he's so damn good. And all in Spanish, too. Well, and, and he does not... He does not speak Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he does not. And uh, he, he uh, uh, I think he really pulled it off. He had... Uh, uh, his his coach at his side and uh, and they would run it over a few times and 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 then he just played it so naturally and uh, and he's such a good counter to the cousins um, the there's so much tension between those guys it's just uh, it, it was it, it's just palatable this is the uh, this is the uh, uh, this is the first time we hear the cousins speak Adrian. we didn't know they could that's talk right. until this episode that's right yeah that thank so God that yeah. he didn't have a high pitched voice or yeah. like Mike yeah. Tyson or something. Yeah. <laughs> they talk in the, in the restaurant though first before they talk at sunset they talk in the restaurant that's true that's true but that sunset shot that whole scene is just perfect western material oh, that, was, yeah. that was a joke about Mike Tyson in case he's listening I don't oh, come to kick my ass <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> maybe an enemy you don't want to make no. <laughs> No, Here's the home address. <laughs> yes. Well, we should wrap this up. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. it. Thank uh, you, Kelly. Thank you, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, thanks, everybody, for listening, and uh, we'll see you all next week um, for episode number 307, uh, and I think that one's called One Minute. Uh, next week is One Minute. This this week, uh, John's was uh, sunset. sunset. Yeah, One Minute. Uh, you got some big stuff coming up next oh, week. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right on, so let's go break bad. <laughs>